Hi folks, this is Jason and I hope you are okay today. It's good to be with you. We're looking at the inspiration of the Bible by A. A. Hodge, uh, a wonderful evangelical scholar that uh, I absolutely think is a great, great Bible teacher. And so we're going to be looking at uh, what he has to say. And I hope that you find it a blessing. So let's uh, come before the Lord and ask his blessing uh, upon uh, this, this uh, piece of writing. A. A. Hodge, a Princeton theologian, 1823-1886. He writes, what are the necessary presuppositions as to principle and matter of fact which must be admitted before the possibility of inspiration or the inspiration of a particular book can be occurred, uh, affirmed. He says, number one, the existence of a personal God, the possessing the attributes, power, intelligence and moral excellence in absolute perfection. Number two, that in this relation to the universe he is at once eminent and transcendent above all and freely acting upon all from without, within all acting through the whole and every part from within the exercise of all his perfections and according to the laws and modes of action he has established for his creatures sustaining and governing them and all their actions. Three, his moral government over mankind and other intelligent creatures whereby he governs them by truth and motives addressed to their reason and will rewards and punishes them according to their moral character and actions and benevolently educates them for their high destiny in his communion and service. Number four, the fact that mankind instead of advancing along a line of natural development from a lower to higher moral condition have fallen to their original state and relation and are now lost in a condition involving corruption, guilt and incapable of recovery without supernatural intervention. Number five, the historical integrity of the Christian scriptures, their veracity as history, and the genuineness and authenticity of the several books. Number six, the truth of Christianity and the sense in which it is set forth in the sacred record. All of these necessary presuppositions, the truth of which is involved in the doctrine that all scriptures are inspired, fall under one or two classes. Those which rest upon intuition and moral spiritual evidences of divine truth, such as the being attributes of God in his relation to the world and to command kind, such as the testimony of conscience and the moral consciousness of men as sinners, justify, condemn and impotent. Those with the rest which rest upon matters of fact depending on historical and critical evidence as to the true origin and contents of the sacred books. If any of these principal facts is doubted, the evidence substantiating them should be sought in their appropriate sources, e.g. the departments of apologetics, the theistic arguments and natural theology, the evidence of Christianity, the historic origin of the scriptures, the canon and criticism, and exegesis of the sacred text. Number two, in what sense and to what extent has the church universe, universally held the Bible to be inspired? That the sacred writers were so influenced by the Holy Spirit that their writings are as whole and in every part God's word to us an authoritative revelation to us from God endorsed by him and sent to us as a rule of faith and practice the original autographs of which are absolutely infallible when interpreted in the sense intended and hence are clothed with absolute divine authority number three what is meant by plenary inspiration a divine influence full and sufficient to secure its ends the end in this case secured is the perfect infallibility of the scriptures in every part as a record of fact and doctrine both in thought and verbal expression so that although they come to us through the instrumentality of the minds, hearts and imaginations, conscience and wills of men they are nevertheless in the strictest sense of the word of God. For what is meant by the phrase verbal inspiration and how can it prove that the words of the Bible were inspired? It is meant that the divine influence of whatever kind it may have been which accompanied the sacred writers in which they wrote extend to their expressions of their thoughts in language as well as to the thoughts themselves. 
the effect being that in the original autograph copies the language expresses the thought God intended to convey with infallible accuracy so that the words as well as the thoughts are God's revelation to, to us. That this influence did extend to the words appears first from the very design of inspiration which is not to secure the infallible correctness of the opinions of the inspired men themselves. Paul and Peter differed, Galatians 2.11 and sometimes the prophets knew not what he wrote, but to secure an infallible record of the truth, but a record consists of language. Men think in words, and the more they think, the more are their thoughts immediately associated with an exactly appropriate verbal expression. Invalibility of thought cannot be secured or preserved independently of an independently of an in fallible verbal rendering. The scriptures affirm this fact in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 13. Which things also we speak not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but with the Holy Ghost teaching comparing spiritual things with spiritual and also 1 Thessalonians chapter 2.13 next the New Testament writers while quoting from the Old Testament for purposes of argument often base their argument upon the words used for ascribing authority to the word as well as the thought Matthew chapter 22 verse 32 and Exodus chapter 3 verse 6 Next, by what means does the church hold that God has affected the result above defined? The church doctrine recognizes the fact that every part of scripture is at once a product of God and man's agency. The human writers have produced each his part in the free and natural exercise of his personal faculties under his historical conditions. God has also acted concurrently in and through them that the whole organism of scripture and every part thereof of his word to us infallibly true in the sense intended absolutely authoritative. God's agency includes three following elements. Number one, his providential agency in producing the scriptures. The whole course of redemption of revelation and inspiration are special functions was a special providence directing the evolution of a special providential history. Here the natural and the supernatural continually interpenetrate but that is of necessity the case the natural was always the rule and the supernatural the exception yet as a little subject to accident and as much the subject of rational design as the natural itself thus God providentially produced the very man for the precise occasion with the faculties qualities education and gracious experiences indeed for the production of the intended writing Moses David Isaiah Paul and John genius and character, nature and grace, peasant, philosopher or prince, the man with him, each subtle personal accident was providentially prepared at the proper moment at the necessary instrumental precondition of the work to be done. Second, revelation of truth is not otherwise attainable. Whenever the writer was not possessed or could not naturally become possessed of the knowledge of God intended to communicate, it was supernatural revealed to him by vision or language. This revelation was supernatural, objective to the recipient, and showed to him to be the truth of divine origin. By appropriate evidence, this direct revelation applies to a large element of the sacred scriptures, such as prophecies of future events, the peculiar doctrines of Christianity, the promise and threatenings of God's word, but it applies no means to all contents of it, but it applies by no means to all the contents of scripture. Third, inspiration. The writers were the subjects of plenary divine influences called inspiration, which acted upon and through their natural faculties in all they wrote, directing them in the choice of subject and the whole course of thought and verbal expression. So it was while not interfering with an exercise of their faculties. They freely and spontaneously produced the very writing which God designed, and which thus possessed the attributes of infallible and authority as above defined. This inspiration differs therefore from revelation, 
in that it was a constant experience of the sacred writers in all they wrote and its effects, the equal infallibility of all the elements of the writings they produced, while as before said revelation was supernaturally vouchsafed only when it was needed in that revelation communicated objectively to the mind of the writer truth otherwise unknown. While inspiration was a divine influence flowing into the sacred writer subjectively, communicating nothing but guiding their faculties in their natural exercise to the producing an infallible record of the matters of history, doctrine, prophecy which God designed to send through them to his church. It differs from spiritual illumination in that the spiritual illumination is an essential element of sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit coming to all true Christians. It never leads to the knowledge of new truth, but only to the personal discernment of spiritual beauty and power of truth already revealed in the scriptures. Inspiration is a special influence of the Holy Spirit, peculiar to the prophets and apostles, and attending them only in the exercise of their functions as accredited teachers. Most of them were the subject both of inspiration and spiritual illumination. Some as Balaam being unregenerate were inspired, though destitute of spiritual spiritual illumination. Proof of the doctrine of the Church of Inspiration. 6. From what source of evidence is the question as to the nature and extent of the inspiration of the scripture to be determined? determined? Number 1. From the statement of scripture themselves and 2. From the phenomenon of scripture which critically examined. How can the propriety of proving the inspiration of scripture from the own assertion be vindicated? We do not reason in a circle when we rest the truth of inspiration of the scripture on their own assertion. We come to this question already believing in their credibility as histories and in that of their writers as witnesses of fact and in the truth of Christianity as in the divinity of Christ. Whatever confirms or, or whatever Christ affirms of the Old Testament and whatever he promises to the apostles and whatever they assert as to the divine influence acting in through themselves or as to the infallibility that authority of their writings must be true, especially as all their claims were endorsed by God working with them by signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Ghost. It is evident that if their claims to inspiration and to the infallibility and authority of their writings are denied, they are consequently charged with fanatical presumption and gross misrepresentation. And the validity of the lid of their testimony in all points is denied when plenary inspiration is desired or Christian faith is undermined. How may the inspiration of the apostles be fairly inferred from the fact that they wrought the miracles? A miracle is a divine sign, accrediting the person to whom the power is delegated as a divinely commissioned agent. Matthew 16, 1 and 4, Acts chapter 14, 3, Hebrews chapter 2, 4. This divine testimony not only encourages but absolutely renders belief obligatory. Where the sign is, God commands us to believe, but he could not con unconditionally command us to believe any other than unmixed truth infallibly conveyed. How may it be shown that the gift of inspiration was promised to the apostles? In Matthew chapter 10 verse 19, Luke chapter 12 verse 12, John chapter 14 26. Let's turn to John 14 26. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And also you can read John 15, 26, 27, John chapter 16, 13, Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 20 and John 13 20. In what several ways did they claim to have possessed the Spirit? They claimed to have the Spirit in fulfillment of the promise of Christ in Acts chapter 2 verse 33, Acts chapter 4 verse 8, Acts chapter 13 verse 2 and 4, Acts chapter 15 verse 28, Acts chapter 21 11, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 8. Second, to to speak as the prophets of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 19, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 8. Third, to speak with plenary authority, 
1 Chronicle 1 Corinthians chapter 2 13 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 13 1 John chapter 4 verse 6 Galatians chapter 1 verse 8 and 9 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 2 3 and 4 they class their writings on a level with the Old Testament scriptures 2 Peter chapter 3 16 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 27 Colossians chapter 4 16 Revelations chapter 2 verse 7 Let's just turn to 1, 2 Peter chapter 3. Two Peter chapter 3 verse 16. 2 Peter 3:16. As also in all his epistles speaking in them of the things in which are those things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction so that's Peter talking about the epistles of Paul on par with the Old Testament how was the claim confirmed quite a few uh, pieces of paper here by Hodge by the holy, simple, temperate, yet heroic lives, by the holiness of the doctrine they taught and its spiritual power as attested by its effect upon communities and individuals, by the miracles they wrought, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4, all these testimonies are a credit to us not only by their own writings, but also by the uniform testimony of the Christians, their contemporaries and the immediate successors. Show that the writers of the Old Testament claimed to be inspired. Moses claimed that he wrote a part or at least of the Pentateuch by divine command. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 19 to 22. David claimed it in 2 Samuel chapter 23 verse 2. As a characteristic fact, the Old Testament writers speak not in their own name, but in the preface, thus says the Lord, the mouth of the Lord had spoken, etc. Jeremiah 9 12, Jeremiah 13 13, Jeremiah 30 verse 4. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 1 you can go into Amos chapter 3 verse 1 Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 21 22 1 Kings chapter 21 28 etc how was their claim confirmed their claim was confirmed to their contemporaries by miracles they wrought by the fulfillment of many of their predictions number 16 28 29 by holding their lives the moral and spiritual perfection of the doctrine and the practical adaptation of the religious system they revealed to the urgent wants of men the claim is confirmed to us principally by the remarkable fulfillment in the subsequent ages of many of their prophecies by the evident relation of the symbolic religion which they promulgated to the facts and doctrines of Christianity proving a divine pre-adjustment of the type of the antitype by the endorsement of Christ and his apostles what are the formulas by which quotations from the Old Testament are introduced into the New and how does these forms express prove the inspiration of the scripture? The Holy Ghost said, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7, the Holy Ghost the signifying in Hebrews 9 8, God saith, Acts chapter 2 17 and um, he goes on there giving quite a few Old Testament and New Testament scriptures. How may the inspiration of the Old Testament writers be proved by the express declaration of the New? Luke chapter 1 verse 70, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, 2 Timothy 3 16, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10 and 12, 2 Peter chapter 1 21. What is the argument on the subject drawn from the manner in which Christ and his apostles argue from the Old Testament as a final authority? Christ constantly quotes the Old Testament in Matthew chapter 21 verse 13 and Matthew 22 verse 43. What evidence of the phenomenon of the scriptures afford as to nature and extent of the human causes have conspired to produce them? Every part of scripture alike bears evidence of human origin. The writers of all the books were men and the process of composition through which they originated was characteristically human. The personal characteristics of thought and feeling of these writers have acted spontaneously in their literary activity and have given character to their writings in a manner precisely similar to the effect of care upon the writing case of other men.
They wrought from human impulses on special occasions with definite design. Each view his subject from an individual standpoint. They gathered the material from all sources, personal experience and observation, ancient documents and contemporary testimony. They arrange the material with reference to their special purpose and draw inference from principles and facts according to the more or less logical habits of their own minds. Their emotions and imaginations are spontaneously exercised and follow a co-factors with their reasoning into their composition. The limitations of their personal knowledge and general condition, mental condition and the defects of their habits of thought and style are as obvious in their writings as any other personal characteristic. They use the language idiom proper to their nation and class. They adopt they adopt the uso loquendi of terms current among their people without committing themselves to the philosophical ideas in which the usage originated. Their mental habits and methods with those of their nation and generation. They for were for the most part Orientals and hence the hence their writings abound with metaphor and symbol although always reliable in statement as far as required for their purpose they never aimed at the definite definiteness of enumeration or chronological or circumstantial narration which characterizes the statistics of modern western nations like all purely literary men of every age they describe the order and the facts of nature according to their appearances and not as related to their abstract law of cause some of these facts have by many careless thinkers been supposed to be inconsistent with the asserted facts of divine guidance. But it is evident upon reflection that if God is to reveal himself at all, it must be under all the limits of humans of thought and speech. And if he inspires human agents to communicate his revelation in writing, he must use them in the manner consistent with their nature as rational and spontaneous agents. And it is evident that all the distinctions between the different degrees of perfection in human knowledge and elegance in human dialect and style are nothing when viewed in the light of common relations of man to God. He obviously could as well reveal himself through the peasant as through the philosopher, and all the better when the personal characteristics of the peasant were providentially in greater prejudice to the special desire. Just seeing what else. Uh, Anyhow, um, I think that'll do for the time being on A. A. Hodge. I'll read some, I'll give some thoughts on what he actually says uh, and how that relates to modern theological debate and discussion. Okay. Um, we're going to just read some of the... Um, creeds of the ancient creeds concerning um, what the creeds have said about the Bible. The Roman Catholic decree of the Council of Trent, session 4, says which gospel our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, first promulgated with his own mouth and then commanded to be preached by his apostles to every creature, seeing clearly that this truth and discipline are contained in the written books and unwritten tradition which received by the apostles from the mouth of Christ himself or from the apostles themselves, the Holy Ghost dictating have come down even to us transmitted as it were from hand to hand. The Synod following the example of the Orthodox Fathers re receives and venerates with an equal affection of piety and reverence all the books both of Old and New Testament. Seeing God is the author of both as also the said traditions as well as those appertaining to faith as to morals as having been dictated either by Christ on word and mouth or by the Holy Ghost and preserved in the Catholic Church by continuous succession. Hmm. I think um, what we get from the Catholic Council of Trent there is putting tradition on the par with uh, the New Testament and Old Testament. I think the early church fathers, if you like, if you read like Irenaeus, it's very clear that there was a very strong belief in apostolic tradition. But even Irenaeus didn't see that as equal to scripture. They saw the apostolic tradition as in the scriptures as authoritative as compared to the actual tradition. 
Uh, that's in Irenaeus what I got. Uh, the Lutheran formula Concordia says we believe, confess and teach that the only rule and norm according to which all dogmas and all doctors ought to be esteemed and judged is no other whatever than the prophetic and apostolic writings of the Old and New Testament as written in Psalm 119 verse 105 in Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. The second Helvetic Confession, a Reformed Confession, says concerning Holy Scriptures we believe and confess that the canonical scriptures of the holy prophets and apostles of each testament are the true word of God and that they possess sufficient authority from themselves alone and not from man for God himself spoke to the fathers, to the prophets and to the apostles and continues to speak to us through the holy scriptures the Belgic confession we confess that this word of God was not sent or delivered by the will of man but that holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost as the Apostle Peter said, and that afterwards God from a special care when, which he has for us and our salvation commanded his servants and prophets and apostles to commit his revealed word to writing, and he himself wrote with his own finger the two tables of the law, therefore we call such writings holy and divine scripture. And then finally the Westminster Confession. Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare his will unto his church. And afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world to commit the same holy unto writing. The authority of the Holy Scriptures for which it ought to be believed and obeyed depended not upon the testimony of any more church but wholly upon God who is truth itself, the author thereof, and thereof it is to be received because it is the word of God. So where do we go from here in terms of the modern scene? Well, Princeton theology, uh, as advocated by A. A. Hodge, B. B. Warfield, and the Hodges, it's very clear that the Bible was inspired of God, that it had no faults in it. And that's what you get very clearly uh, from A. Hay Hodge. What also you get is a very, uh, very intelligent explanation of how the Bible sees itself. If you read uh, some of the Oxford scholars, um, we can just get uh, get a book. Sorry about this. So if we look at some of the Oxford scholars that have been around <coughs> recently, last few years, in recent academic uh, theological discussion, basically um, academic theologians uh, and cultural commentators, uh, even since the 1920s, right up in to the 1960s and 70s, and then to our present day, will continually strawman um, Orthodox Christianity by calling the Orthodox doctrine of Scripture as wooden, that it is a, a kind of wooden conception and an idolatrous conception in, in terms of that Orthodoxy worship scripture rather than the God of scripture, that orthodoxy has a wooden view of scripture. Now all these have been strawman arguments that these Oxford scholars uh, such as James Barr and um, theologians that have gone back right to the 1920s have continually strawman orthodox Christianity on this issue of scripture. No decent theologian in the orthodox camp uh, orthodox evangelical camp such as Warfield or anybody like that none of these theologians had a wooden view of scripture they taught scripture as taught by scripture that has to be said so when we get people like Jerome Bars um, he was a noted commentator um, If we turn to page 14 in his book, Fundamental Fundamentalism, 
uh, a very uh, prominent book in the history of theology in, in the UK concerning fundamentalism. He writes, what is the point at which the fundamentalists use the Bible conflicts with the use of it by other people? The plain man asked this question would commonly say that the fundamentalist is a person who takes the Bible literally. This, however, is far from being a correct or exact description. The point of conflict between fundamentalists and others is not over literally but over in inerrancy. Even if fundamentalists sometimes, sometimes say that they take the Bible literally, the facts of fundamentalist interpretation show that this is not so. What fundamentalists insist is not that the Bible must be taken literally, but that, that it must be so interpreted as to avoid any admission that it contains any kind of error. In order to avoid imputing error to the Bible, fundamentalists twist and turn back and forward between literal and non-literal interpretation. The dominant fundamentalist assertion about the Bible, namely that it is a divinely inspired and infallible, do not mean that it must be taken literally and are not so interpreted in the conservative evangelical literature what they mean and are constantly interpreted as meaning is that the Bible contains no error or any kind not only theological error but error in any sort of historical geographical or scientific fact is completely absent from the Bible in order to expand the Bible as thus inerrant, inerrant the fundamentalist interpreter varies back and forward between literal and non-literal understanding indeed he has to do so in order to obtain a Bible that is error free now for those who who've uh, looked into uh, James Barr I mean he changed his position there uh, his earlier work made it clear that he thought the fundamentalists were literalist <laughs> so now he's changed his position he's changed his position because his first book got lambasted and critiqued <laughs> But uh, notice here that he's making the accusation that the fundamentalist and the word fundamentalist today does not have the same understanding of fundamentalist when James Barr wrote it and it doesn't have the same connotation as the fundamentalist in the 1920s. When the word fundamentalist was used in the 1920s it was seen as Christians who were against evolution and biblical criticism. When Jerome Barr's is using James Barr is using the word fundamentalism, he's using it in the 1920s context. But there is the fundamentalism word fundamentalism today, which has a connotation of Islamic fundamentalism. So we have to be very careful when we're using the word fundamentalism. But if you notice in his language here, he's basically saying that the hermeneutical tool for the fundamentalist or Christian fundamentalist is inerrancy. Now this is just not true. This is a complete straw man of Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox Christianity as we see expounded by A. A. Hodge here, if you read the article Inspiration of the Bible, what A. A. Hodge is doing is try to give you an expose of what the Bible teaches about itself. So for the Orthodox Christian, what is important is exegesis, to see what the Bible says about itself. And the Bible claims inerrancy, the Bible claims to be inspired. So it's not inerrancy as the hermeneutical key, it's the scriptures themselves collected and collated in their historical and contextual context that give us what we believe about the Bible. So that's just an example comparing a top academic scholar such as James Barr who was an Oxford scholar of tremendous eminence straw manning basically orthodox Christianity and that's what you find in academic theology you'll always find amongst the academic theologians who are not in the orthodox stream always caricaturing orthodox theology and 
you will constantly find this concerning the doctrine of scripture you will hear comments like all oh, the you'll hear words like Christian fundamentalist that's a demonizing language that's to to um, make sure that you 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 are made to feel some kind of anti-intellectual but also it's language that that controls the debate and the discussion and then you have these kind of straw man caricatures of the orthodox position so that's just a little bit about academic theology and theologians we've looked at James Barr an Oxford scholar now I just want to make a note about this issue of learning er inerrancy and the inspiration of the Bible. As time goes on, theology within the denominations is going to be more eclectic. There is a moving away from the scriptures within the mainline denominations. There is a tendency to try and move away from the more conservative evangelical expressions of Christianity. And so what we, you're going to find is, and what you do find in the emergent church, for example, is the def definition of what inspiration is, is not a case, a case of what the Bible teaches, but it's a case of what culture teaches. So what you find is you'll hear arguments like this, that everything changes and culture changes and therefore... Uh, the Bible had its own particular inspiration, but culture will change and have some helpful things, and we can interpret scripture according to culture. So you're going to find a lot of Christians moving into this kind of idea where they allow culture to dictate what theology is and use that as the hermeneutical key in order to understand the Bible. So, for example, people feel that a lot of young people will feel that morally we've advanced and now we believe in gay rights and homosexuality so what you're going to find is a lot of people who claim to be Christian in the church say well we've advanced in morality concerning homosexuality so therefore we need to go back and interpret the Bible text in accordance with this new cultural understanding so you see that's a cultural perspective going and trying to understand the Bible this is completely and Christian, it's completely anti evangelicalism, it's completely anti biblical and is a wrong methodology. But it's going to get more and more known over time. Secondly, as you see in the emergent church, what you'll find is a pick and mix theology where you will find pastors and theologians and people on the ground who begin to disagree with the authority of Christ and will begin to say and are saying that the, there are faults in the Bible there are moralities in the Bible that we do not agree with but there are some good things and so what you're going to find is more and more churches more and more Christians come into this agenda where they will pick parts of Christianity that they want and reject parts of Christianity that they don't want this is already happening and has been happening for some time in some Christian circles and once that happens apostasy and liberalism flourish and the Christian faith has been destroyed my point is this is that A. A. Hodge is giving you a biblical model of what the Bible says about itself and if you stick to that model and hold fast to that model you will grow strong in your faith and you will be a, a stronger Christian as you hold on to the word of life, the word of God. I'm going to read to you a passage of scripture that will be a help to you. It says, Wherein shall a young man clean his way by taking heed according to the word? 
with my whole heart have I sought thee up. Well, let me not wonder from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. I will not forget thy word. Hold fast to the word of God. Do not yield to the pick and mix theologians who pick and mix the bits of Bible here and there. Do not yield to the James Barr Oxford Don theologians who will critique the Bible, say there are faults in the Bible and accuse you of being a kind of anti-intellectual fundamentalist when you're not, then what you want is to be faithful to the Word of God. Hold fast to the Word. When people say that culture is above the Bible, and begin to interpret the Bible according to culture, when it should be the Bible that interprets culture, it should be the Bible that is authoritative over culture. So, thank you for listening, and I hope that this has been an inspiration and encouragement to you to hold fast to the Word of God in these dangerous days. God bless you.